Welcome to everyone to this installment of the Office of National Mission webinars for uh, urban and inner city mission. Uh, today, we're really glad to uh, be able to offer another webinar, which will deal with the topic of uh, work, uh, especially in the cities, as it always op offers us a great opportunity to be uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, today, our topic is reaching the English-speaking next generation Asian Americans for Christ. And our presenter for today is the uh, Reverend Dr. Terry Chan. He is the pastor and lead missionary for Christ of All Nations Lutheran Church in San Francisco, uh, California. Um, uh, Terry, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, for the invitation. Look forward to our time together. And I'm, I'm, I know that the Holy Spirit is going to bless it as we uh, seek to lift up the name of Christ and to bring honor to his name uh, so that people can hear of his great saving love for him. So uh, I remind our participants that um, uh, Dr. Chan is going to be uh, making a presentation for about 45 minutes. And then after that, we're going to leave time for question and answers. So uh, feel free at any time to um, submit a question using the question and answer feature or the Q&A feature on Zoom. So when you hover over and see your menu bar, you'll see the Q&A feature. So we encourage you to um, uh, send your questions in. And then at the end of the webinar, I will kind of bring them all together in order that I can uh, ask those questions of Dr. Chan. So Terry, it's all yours. We're excited to hear about this topic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the topic again is reaching English speaking next generation Asian Americans for Christ. And there's a number of ways that this topic can be approached. So for example, if I were presenting this topic to an <laughs> Asian uh, immigrant generation looking at how to reach the next generation, uh, it would be from that perspective. If it was a uh, next generation group of Asian Americans, it could be approached in a different manner. And with this presentation today, it is with a, a fairly mixed group of people, both from an Asian and non-Asian background. And so it'll be from a uh, perspective uh, recognizing the audience that is uh, participating today. And so as uh, with most things, I like to begin with uh, a solid foundation of a scripture. And so um, the assumptions that we have regarding scripture is very important. And I call them the three D's uh, when it comes to this particular topic. And so uh, the first uh, topic is, um, or the first of my three D's is diaspora. And from Acts 17, 26 to 27, it says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should appoint, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And so the diaspora, we recognize that uh, Asian people have come to America and that this is really a part of God's plan and design. The uh, next D is uh, diversity. And from Revelation 7, 9 to 10, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could remember, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so a very uh, picture of diversity of what heaven will look like. Um, the next slide is, uh, the third D is demographics. And so we recognize that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is predominantly 93% white English speaking. Whereas the United States will become a majority minority nation around 2042. So in about 20 years, there will be no majority group in the United States. 
And something I'll touch on a little later is the common languages spoken in each state other than English or Spanish. And so the question then becomes, why? Why reach the English speaking next generation Asian Americans for Christ? And the Bible again is the foundation for our reason. The Bible is what inspires us. The Bible wants the blessing of faith and salvation to be for all people. And so again, I have scripture and I have four G's to share. And um, the first one is that um, it's God's desire. This is what is on God's heart. Uh, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. First Timothy 2, 3, 2, 6. And then the second G is the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. Matthew 28. And the third G is the Great Commission. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 34 to 39. And then a fourth G is, again, the passage I shared earlier about uh, a great multitude from every nation, from Revelation 7, 9 to 10. And so those are the passages that help to shape our thinking and our hearts about reaching next generation Asian Americans for Christ. And then the question is, who are next generation multi-Asian Americans? Notice that on this slide, I have the words multi-Asian uh, in parentheses. That is the trending term that is now being used, whereas um, there in the past have been terms such as pan-Asians or simply Asian American or first and second generation or immigrant Americans. Uh, and so uh, the more common term that is now trending is multi-Asian because the Asian people are quite diverse. Um, when we look at the population of uh, Asian Americans in the United States, we can see from the 2020 census that um, the, the population is now over 7% in the United States. And that is over 24 million Asian Americans. And you can see on this uh, chart here that the darker colors are where the populations uh, numbers are uh, larger. You can see that it is on the West Coast uh, and the East Coast, but also splattering in different parts of the United States as well. That 24 million population is also um, larger than the entire population of the country of Taiwan. And so when you compare the population, that is quite a mission field. This Diagram again highlights uh, the population of Asian people, the top 10 cities and the top 10 numbers. And that can be a helpful tool to begin to identify where the Asian population is. But it is uh, scattered throughout the United States. This next slide is um, very interesting. Uh, because it helps to recognize that the Asian population historically has now been uh, growing quite fast. In fact, it is now the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States. It's growing faster than the Hispanic population. So back in 
around 1870 when my ancestors first came to the United States. There were 63,000 Asians. By the time my grandmother was born, there was about 147,000. By 1960s, uh, when um, I returned from Hong Kong and my family returned and came back to the United States, um, there was about a million uh, Asian people in the United States. And of course, the 1965 Immigration Act uh, that changed the laws had a great part in uh, increasing the number of people coming from Asia. And basically from 1960 to 1980, it quadrupled to now 3.5 million. The following 20 years, it tripled to nearly 12 million. And today there's over 24 million. By 2040, it's projected to be over 34 million. And 2060, it will be 46 million. And that is uh, simply another generation down the road. And many of you will still uh, be doing ministry at that time among uh, Asian people in this uh, time period. Uh, this number of 46 million plus Asian Americans is actually uh, going to surpass or be uh, similar to the population of African Americans in the United States by 2060. Uh, this diagram then shows that uh, there are a major uh, group of immigrants in the United States. So presently about 14 to 15 million immigrants uh, from Asia in the United States. So what this is telling us is that if there is a population of 24 million Asians and 14, 15 million are immigrants from Asia, that means about 10, 11 million are Asians who are born here in the United States. In other words, they will be predominantly English speaking. In addition to uh, many of the 15 million, who will have some degree of proficiency in English as well. And so the focus on reaching uh, English speaking next generation Asian Americans. There is also um, understanding the languages that are spoken. So in addition to Spanish and English, this chart shows us the um, third most common language spoken in each state. And when you look at this chart, uh, you can see the orange highlights, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. All of those are predominantly, uh, are the third most spoken language is Mandarin and Cantonese, a Chinese a language, an Asian language. But you'll also notice that there are other places such as uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Georgia, Nebraska, where Vietnamese is the third most common language. And then there's Tagalog and uh, Hmong in Wisconsin. Uh, and so uh, nearly uh, more than half of the United States the third most dominant language is an Asian language. Uh, and that's going to reflect then on Asian population and opportunities for ministry among Asian people and many English speaking. Um, and so, uh, but um, Asian Americans are not defined only by language. Uh, we often uh, thought about that and uh, language is not the only criteria. Rather, uh, far more than being a statistic, uh, next generation multi-Asian Americans are diverse. So that's why the term multi-Asian. So they're multilingual, oftentimes speaking more than one language or more than one Chinese dialect. They are multicultural. They can be multi-ethnic as well as multi-generational. And so these are uh, some facets of uh, the multi-Asian Americans and their diversity. Um, we can compare and contrast all understandings and definitions of Asians in America. Many times we have um, 
looked at Asian Americans as immigrants, um, at, or sometimes we refer to them as OBC or overseas born Chinese or uh, overseas born uh, Korean or uh, whatever those terms might be, uh, which is not always a popular description that they appreciate. But they, there's a picture um, in popular culture or in media that often uh, describes these immigrant generations simply as laborers. So they work in the restaurants, they live in the ghettos of Chinatown or Koreatown, uh, Little Saigon, they are refugees or illegal. They are non-citizens and that they cannot speak English. Or a second generation, uh, they're labeled as ABC, American born Chinese. And again, not always a popular term among the people, but they're viewed as the nerds, the geeks, uh, they're smart in school, uh, poor in social skills, they're quiet, non-athletic, deferential, non-assertive, they're home buyers, they're tiger moms. And, and, and I think perhaps except for the last one, uh, now this could be like my profile on a dating app or something or a resume, but that's um, not really the picture that we really have anymore. Rather, I view multi-Asians in the fo following five generational language and cultural groups using the generic numbering descriptions. These descriptions are generalities and maybe stereotypical to some people, but the description are based on my lifelong experiences as a 1.5 generation person, a first generation Asian immigrant. And yet uh, my family has been here since 1869. Uh, and so I'm also a fifth generation American. And so these are some recent observations uh, based on research and my own evolving world view. So a 1.0 generation person comprises the native language and immigrant generation group. They are culturally native to their homeland and are cultural outsiders in America, though they can adapt and assimilate or acculturate over time. However, there is a, also a new wave of 1.0 generation immigrants that have the three E's. They are well-educated, economically capable, and recruited for employment at high levels in many professional fields. And so that is the emerging 1.0 generation. A 1.5 generation are those born outside the United States, but raised in American culture from an early age, and subjectively those who arrive pre-high school age. And then depending on their age at arrival, this generation may prefer either their native language or English, or maybe competently bilingual in speaking and reading and writing. They trend toward being bicultural and can spontaneously navigate between both cultural settings. A 2.0 generation person are those born and raised in the United States by 1.0 or 1.5 generation parents. English is their dominant language, though they may still possess the ability to converse in the language of their parents and grandparents. They trend toward the culture they've been raised in, but may maintain a deep appreciation of the culture of their family background. A 2.5 generation person are those born and raised in the United States to the 1.5 or 2.0 generation group. Well, let's see, I just did that. The 3.0 generation trend are those of Asian descent, born and raised in America and fully assimilated into pop culture. Engagement with previous generation groups would be a cross-cultural experience and may be difficult for some to embrace. The 3.0 generation is trending toward being not just a biracial generation, but a multi-ethnic Asian generation with biracial or multiracial ancestry. And so we, I, I talked about enculturation and uh, assimilation and acculturation a little bit. So uh, just to wrap up this idea of the generations, uh, this diagram would help us to uh, picture um, uh, the culture. So uh, assimilation is where we are looking at the melting pot theory, where you should be like me in order to fit in, you have to kind of give up a little bit of your own culture. There's a loss of custom and self-identity in order to 
assimilate and be like everyone else to blend in. Whereas acculturation is more like this salad bowl. You belong, you're either the mushroom or the egg or the lettuce, uh, but you are who you are. You are able to uh, be yourself in this salad bowl and the differences actually make us better. Rather than having to blend in and melt together, we recognize our uniqueness and we celebrate that. And that is acculturation. And so the next generation is not only about language, uh, but it is also about nonverbal communication. How do we interact with people? And so cultural enculturation, the culture you are born in, that you adopt, uh, acculturation and assimilation is likely to be on a continuum. So there's Asian culture and Asian values on one end. There is Western culture and values on the other end. And yet it is on a continuum. So as you are reaching out to an English speaking uh, next generation Asian American person, that person may fall on either end or anywhere in between when it comes to different things. So they might be very Asian with some customs, but very Western with some other values. And so it is often hard to know exactly where they fall in until you actually engage and develop a relationship with that individual. And so it's hard to say, well, everyone is like this or everyone will follow this particular culture or not. And so uh, culture and the customs are practiced from both American and native culture. And so some examples are uh, in Asian culture, many Asian cultures, not all, but many Asian cultures will remove their shoes when they enter into a home. And so uh, that is often practiced. That is often um, requested even of outside visitors. Um, and then, uh, Another difference is the greeting of uh, children or elders. Um, in, in Asian culture, when uh, some elders arrive, the children are expected to come and greet them in person uh, rather than a, an elderly person chasing down that uh, young child and embracing them. So that is a cultural difference. Um, also something as simple as eating from a bowl of rice um, that is very different and even different among the Asian people. So there's the Chinese style where you would actually hold the bowl in your hand, you would raise it to your mouth, you would use your chopsticks to uh, sweep the food into your mouth. Uh, but doing so, the Koreans would think that is barbaric. Uh, the Korean culture would leave their bowl firmly sitting on the table. They use a different type of rice, it's a stickier rice, and they would use their chopsticks to raise up the food to the mouths. And then there is an in-between, a Japanese style, where they hold the bowl in their hand, but they do not bring it to the mouth, but they use their chopsticks to bring it to the mouths. So even among Asians, there is a diversity of, of culture. And then there's the great uh, diversity of do you slurp and burp or do you not? So in some Asian cultures, the verbal uh, eating is a way of communicating to the cook, the chef, that this is delicious food. And yet in some Western cultures, uh, if you're slurping and burping, why that is socially unaccepted and you need to apologize or and uh, make an excuse for doing so. And so those are just uh, some um, cultural dynamics of uh, on a continuum, how Western and how Asian people are able to adapt along and where they fall in terms of their practices. Uh, but what is really important is um, the values. What do um, the Asian Americans value? They value belonging. They value a sense of uh, family. And within the family, there is the idea of the birth family, your relatives, your ancestors. That is something that is important to them, a sense of belonging. There's the church family, 
where brothers and sisters in Christ are considered to be just as close as uh, blood relatives, that the, a church family is uh, a very important uh, aspect for them. And then any kind of a group family, any kind of affinity group, uh, whether it be a uh, small group, a home group, a fellowship group, uh, a social club of some kind, uh, groups tend to give a sense of belonging and family. And that is a very strong value among Asians, Asian Americans. Uh, there's also various outreach techniques uh, when you are uh, working with uh, Asian Americans, uh, next generation and so on. Uh, and it depends on uh, what their background is. And so uh, my background is Chinese. And so I'll use Chinese as an example. So if you are, Witnessing to someone from mainland China, they come from an atheist background. And so their question is going to be, why is there a God? Versus government or political party or family loyalty. Their question is, why is there a God? And if you're working with someone who's from a more Western influenced country, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, and others, uh, their question is, what is my God? Is it going to be money or fame or children or possessions or education? And if you come from a uh, from Taiwan, where it's more of an indigenous native culture, their question is, who is God? Versus ancestral worship. Why should I believe in your God that says my ancestors are condemned? That is one of the most challenging questions um, for people who are uh, focused on ancestral worship. And so those are some differences. And uh, even uh, the English speaking next generation have this as a part of their background, their DNA and, and their worldview. And so uh, the context and the setting for reaching Asian Americans can vary. Uh, it can be a congregational setting where a congregation is wanting to reach out to Asian Americans, or it could be an ethnic uh, Asian American uh, church reaching out to other Asian Americans. So uh, there are different congregational ministries in which this is done. There is also great opportunity on campus ministry uh, where um, there are many uh, Asians on our college campuses. Uh, the Asian population on our college campuses exceed 1 million and is the largest uh, ethnic group. Then there's simply community ministry. You might know someone who is a neighbor or a coworker, a business uh, uh, related or a professional related person. Uh, and there's opportunity to be reaching out to them as well. So it's just being aware of your own uh, context and your own setting, and there are different ways in which that can uh, be done, how we can go about reaching them. And so um, one of the things that we can uh, do is, uh, I have some other presentations on uh, how we can be reaching out to people. So I have a presentation also on intercultural ministry, reaching people from a culture different than your own. And that uh, presentation will focus on strategy, ministry to, through, by, and beyond, and with. Uh, it will focus a little more on uh, understanding enculturation, assimilation, and acculturation. And then um, I also describe a model of ministry, a leadership model of intercultural relational leadership development, IRL development or IRLD. Um, and then for more on the culture, on culture, the dynamics of culture, I have a presentation on how to exegete a culture uh, using uh, a lot of the writings from Hoshti then, um, examples on how different cultures view things through context, power distance, individualism and collectivism and ambiguity. And so those are 
um, additional uh, ways in which we can uh, keep learning about some of those. Um, I'd like to now uh, focus a little bit more on the strategies. And uh, to me, it's about relationships and leadership. Uh, when it comes to reaching um, Asian Americans, second generation, English speaking, multi Asian, next generation, um, I don't think that um, it's one program fits all. So I move away from a programmatic uh, philosophy. Rather, I see uh, effectiveness focus on relationships and on leadership. And so it's always um, key to have that in place. So um, this uh, intercultural leadership, relational leadership development is a key ingredient. And some aspects of that are having mutual respect, that it is uh, intercultural leaders working together. So if you're working across cultures, uh, that mutual respect must be there. It cannot be a top-down type of relationship, uh, even if it's expressed by the laity at times. Um, it must also be uh, comparable on levels of authority and responsibility, and that um, there is um, a co-equal type of uh, uh, status in working together. There's also uh, the need for intentional identification, recruitment, development, and deployment of uh, leaders in meaningful positions. And so uh, these are aspects of intercultural relational leadership development. These are uh, things that can help to uh, bring together and build relationships and leadership. Uh, this next graph is um, about diversity. It's a cycle of uh, diversity, of mission to congregation to leadership. And so a diverse um, mission field leads to a diverse congregation and mission leadership core. A diverse leadership core results in diverse mission outreach. And thirdly, a diverse mission outreach leads to the development of ecclesiastical diversity. And a de developed ecclesiastical diversity leads back to a diverse mission field. So it's a cycle of leadership that happens uh, in the congregation, in mission awareness, and in leadership. Uh, for more on Asian leadership, uh, Asian leadership is uh, different and a good source is uh, a book by Paul Hokunaga and I will have a reference for that title uh, later on. But uh, intercultural relational leadership development is about equipping Asians in leadership capacity. It is equipping non-Asians in intercultural leadership. So how do the different cultures interact together? How do they relate to one another? And it's also about equipping congregations or the different ministry settings that are in place for uh, reaching uh, the English speaking next generation Asian Americans. Um, so there's a uh, mutual leadership in mentoring and coaching. And so uh, in this intercultural relationship that happens, um, there is a mutual learning that takes place between the two. Often we think about mentoring or coaching a person, coaching them up, uh, but rather this is more of a lateral type of mentoring and coaching. And so you might be familiar with a uh, chart like this one where um, it's a uh, coaching mentoring model. First step is I do, you watch, we talk. Next step is I do, you help, we talk. Thirdly is you do, I help, and we talk. Fourthly, you do, I watch, and we talk. And then the fifth and final step is you do, and someone else watches. In other words, you then 
begin to coach up another person and you multiply leaders. Uh, if we take this as an example, but we do it in a sense of mutual learning, then it changes the dynamic. It's not just I do and you watch, but we do, we do together and we watch and we talk. We do, you, we help and we talk. We do, we help and we talk. And we do, we watch and we talk. And we do and we recruit others to watch. And so it's a mutual coaching model that can be used effectively in intercultural leadership development. The, there are some models that I find to be um, effective and a model for multi-Asian ministry. It could, you can call it a church planting model. It can be a, a, a way of uh, reaching out. Uh, but <clears throat> at this multi-Asian ministry model uh, is to begin with that English speaking multi-Asian core group. It could be people from various Asian backgrounds. It could be Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, um, uh, Japanese, and they are all gathered together. Uh, and this is kind of a half step toward multi-ethnicity. You can take a, an ethnic specific group and hope that it might become multi-ethnic, but for many Asians, that's a big jump. It is an easier half step to go from being ethnic specific to then being multi-Asian. And you'll find this often um, in, on a college campus model where there's an Asian outreach and all the Asians are gathered from various backgrounds. Some are international students, some are second, third generation, but they all gather together. They're still speaking English and that's their fellowship group. And so it's taking that concept and applying it to this church planting. They're the core group, the focus group, reaching the English speaking next generation people. And the uh, dynamics of this is that this multi-Asian core group can bridge forward for the next generation, for the future generation. If they were to plant a church, they would now have a church that their children can be a part of. Otherwise, knowing that that next church will probably be taking another step toward multi-ethnic ministry. And yet this multi-Asian core group can also still bridge back to various Asian ethnic groups using the specific languages that are needed because they're coming from a number of different Asian backgrounds. There will still be relationships with those who speak uh, a native language. And as the need arises, as people are identified, there's opportunity to bridge back and reach back and have ministry with those who are needing specific language assistance. And so this multi-Asian core group becomes the catalyst for ministry, both reaching forward as well as for uh, reaching uh, back to other language ministries. And so um, this is uh, the model that I believe will be um, an effective model and a powerful model for uh, English speaking next generation ministry. And then I'd like to share with you a, an ethnic church planting model. And um, it's uh, based on some writings by um, Jerry Appleby. It's a little bit dated. And so there are some things that uh, we probably today would uh, uh, look at differently and say there's maybe a different way of phrasing it or describing it. Um, but this ethnic church planting model um, starts with uh, churches that start at a physical distance from the sponsor. And so we call that a natural birth. So a church 
decides to plant an ethnic church in a neighborhood geographically removed from the planting church. I know of a church um, that was uh, started in San Francisco, uh, but with assistance from a church in St. Louis. And so that is um, a, a natural birth, starting a ethnic church. Then there is the adoption model where a sponsoring church finds an existing church in another neighborhood and adopts it to help it in its development. There is a implantation model. And this is where some of the wording might be uh, different. We can change some of this, but a sponsoring church begins an ethnic mission in this building, realizing eventually it needs to be transplanted to a neighborhood where it can grow. Well, I think transplanting to a different neighborhood is probably not necessarily a, um, necessary. Then uh, number two is that there's more than one organized church meeting in the same building. So all the congregations work in a continuing fellowship to build unity. All the expenses associated for the building are shared and proportionately by each group. Each group is equally accountable to the district or to the state church. And a picture of that is this uh, diagram a natural birth, a church that plants another church within its facilities with the intention of keeping it there. So one church may have multiple languages and reaching multiple um, ethnic groups. Another is, again, the adoption model, where a church reaches out to an existing church in their neighborhood and adopts them into their church family and where they now share the facilities. Um, and the uh, dynamic here is that they remain two separate organizations, but <clears throat> it is much better to be partners in ministry rather than simply being a landlord and tenant. And that, that's uh, the uh, dynamic that uh, can either be built on well or could end up being just you know mere renter-landlord relationship. There's the transition model where uh, an older church is growing uh, older, it is uh, dying, and now it's going to transition and reach out to a new ethnic group in that area. And then thirdly, more than one culture in one church organization. Uh, that's really this diagram here where you have a multi-worship service. Uh, when more than one worship service is held in the same facility. Sometimes simultaneously. And the service may be cultural, but it's usually language-based. And uh, I know of a, an English-speaking congregation that has a Hispanic ministry, and they time their, their service so that they both uh, reach the point of Holy Communion at the same time, and they actually join together uh, for the celebrating of the sacrament. And so a multi-worship service type. There's multi-language classes, again, uh, various languages taking place at the same time. There's a multicultural church, one that is designed for uh, different church groups, a variety of cultural groups, and so on. And so that is uh, a, a quick uh, overview of a ethnic church planting um, model that can apply to reaching the English speaking next generation Asian Americans. And so uh, some additional resources uh, that I mentioned, uh, uh, some seminars that are available, uh, how to execute a culture and also intercultural ministry, reaching people from a culture other than your own or different than your own. Uh, there is also the inaugural multi-Asian gathering in conjunction with the multi-ethnic symposium at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. It will be held uh, May 3rd and 4th. And if you register for the multi-ethnic symposium, you are able to attend the multi-ethnic gathering for free. So such a good deal. So that will follow on May 4th and 5th. And then there's also the Chinese Lutherans in Mission Building, uh, the CLIMB conference, an annual conference. This year it will be held at Trinity Lutheran Church in Hasi and the Heights. If you are interested in attending, let me know and I'll put you in contact with the sponsors. Uh, this is uh, 
held mostly in English along with Cantonese and Mandarin. And then um, the additional uh, resources I recommend also, if you would like to do more reading, uh, it is uh, an invitation to lead. It is about um, a Chinese, uh, not Chinese, but Asian American leadership and how that differs by Paul Tokunaga. Uh, there's also um, Growing Healthy Asian American Churches by Peter Cha and other editors, that is helpful. If you want something on culture, uh, Leading Across Culture by James Pluteman is a helpful resource. <clears throat> if you want also <clears throat> more on culture, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a book by Halshti on cultures and organizations. And finally, the a book by Appleby that is um, missions that have come to home to America. And so those are some additional resources. And uh, seeing the clock at 11.45, uh, I am right at the point of uh, concluding uh, this presentation on reaching English speaking next generation Asian Americans. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chan. <laughs> Uh, really appreciate your uh, great presentation here. So uh, again, I would encourage our participants. We're really glad that uh, you joined us today and we have quite a number. So um, uh, again, I would encourage you if you have a question for Dr. Chan to submit it uh, into our uh, question and answer uh, feature that you find in your Zoom menu. Uh, for most people, I think that's at the bottom of your, of your uh, browser Although I think for some people, you can also put it at the top. So if you have any questions, uh, please be sure to uh, make me aware of that. And we'd love to ask Dr. Chan. But to kind of get things started off, um, you mentioned a lot of church planting models. Uh, is there, uh, which one's your favorite? I guess put it that way. Do you have a favorite church planting model? Hey, um, uh, I would say that um, the one I favor uh, most is the multi-Asian uh, model that I started with, uh, where uh, it's the English-speaking uh, group that is is uh, the center, and where they are then able to uh, reach forward for the future generations, as well as then reach backwards for um, uh, native language generation. They just are a can be a key catalyst. And that is uh, the English speaking uh, core group that can uh, do that work. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, someone did ask the question uh, if this presentation will be available for later use and viewing. And the answer is yes, there are a couple of ways that that will happen. Uh, in uh, 24 to 48 hours, we will post this on the LCMS Urban and Inner City Mission YouTube channel. And then eventually it will also make its way onto the Senate website uh, that you would go under the Office of National Mission, where we work, National Ministry. And then again, go to the uh, Urban and Inner City Mission uh, page and the webinars. Uh, this one and many others will also be listed uh, for people uh, for people to view. So there's many other webinars that our, our, uh, our viewers may also be interested in seeing. Um, Another question is, uh, when you're doing mission work among Asians, is there a particular group that you find to be the most receptive to the gospel? Um, I think all the groups uh, are, are receptive. Um, it just depends on uh, the particular context of that group. Uh, there are some groups that are much more um, resistant to the gospel. They are coming from uh, a place of uh, not knowing what church is like and, and what it means to be part of church. And that's why uh, developing relationships is key to uh, reaching out to those people. Uh, once uh, good relationships are established, uh, then th uh, those uh, gospel conversations can begin to happen. Okay, very good. But in terms of national identities, for example, we know that um, 
uh, you, you probably have the statistic, but a pretty good percentage of South Koreans are Christian. Mm -hmm. um, Filipinos obviously have a long history with Catholicism. Um, and that the, uh, my understanding is that uh, there's quite a few Hmong Christians. So I, I don't know if you had any um, comments or observations along those lines. Well, um, as far as the Lutheran church goes, the, the Chinese uh, are the largest Asian groups in terms of congregations. Um, and uh, we have a number of, uh, and then the Koreans are probably the next largest number. Um, and they, they, those two groups uh, have also um, probably the, uh, the longest history within our church body. And so that's where we have the most uh, uh, established churches and the most resources and have raised up uh, pastors and leaders, church workers and the like. So, uh, so those two groups have been uh, quite, uh, we've been quite effective over against others. Uh, although I believe there's uh, some tremendous potential for uh, the, the Vietnamese and also the Hmong. I think they, they are actually uh, very open and, and willing to uh, engage. Right. Do, do you find a distinction from uh, with the Chinese coming, say, from Taiwan or Hong Kong, as opposed to those who've been exposed to a very strong um, atheist, atheistic uh, strain from the mainland? Uh, so they are very different in that sense, um, that they uh, oftentimes... Uh, will uh, just respond very differently, uh, sharing with a, an atheist that there is a God and explain who God is. Uh, it can just, you know, it's like, it all turns on some lights for them and they're, they're just so overwhelmed. Uh, and for those with uh, more of a Western Hong Kong background, they are, they are also then uh, uh, so, uh, blessed when they realize that, that it's, there's something greater than their possessions or their money. Uh, one of the harder challenges that I, I find are uh, those that, uh, because they are not coming from a history of Christian background, uh, so many of them will question, you know, why should I believe in your God that says my ancestors who were not believers who are you know, idol worshipers or um, ancestral worshipers, why should I believe in your God? Because they obviously did not believe in Jesus. And so that's, that's a big hurdle for some cultures. Right, and, I, and I'm tempted to ask what the answer is for that, but there may be none. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, very, very, very good. Um, if you were to, um, uh, I always think it's interesting when, um, you know, the, the dominant, uh, you know, Anglo culture in the U.S. Uh, gets to meet other cultures. And, um, you know, sometimes it's so interesting to see how other cultures uh, have uh, a, a different perspective on things, on, on certain things, which uh, sometimes I would think is actually better. So I don't get any uh, comments in general on what you think particular strengths are of Asian cultures, kind of compared to the Anglo culture. Well, uh, I, I think all cultures are are equally uh, good. Uh, you know, in, you know, culture is something that God created, and so there's there's really. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is a all matter of how, what do we do with the culture? Um, and uh, one of the things about Asian culture that, um, that I, I do admire is, is the, that focus on belonging and, and family. Uh, that is a very strong uh, key, but that's also with many cultures. And I think, yeah. um, uh, you know, that, that idea of you know, belonging and how do we then help people belong to the, the church and uh, uh, or whatever we happen to be doing is um, something that can be effective. 
Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Um, well, I'm not um, seeing any more questions here from our uh, the people who have, oh, excuse me, I have another one that came right up here. Um, what values do Asian Americans hold that might strengthen, complement, or enrich our own Lutheran doctrine? What values? Um, what, uh, can you re repeat that again? Yeah, 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 it's, yeah it's, a, it, it's a pretty deep question. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, um, so we know that, you know, Asian Americans are bringing some different values to the table than, than our general culture. Um, do you see any of those values that would, you know, strengthen or enrich um, our perspective as Lutherans? Well, I think one of the um, great things is that uh, historically the Lutheran church is an immigrant church. Now they came mm -hmm. over from Europe uh, and they understand that in their history. And that really places the Lutheran church in a very good position of understanding uh, reaching um, immigrant population and then the next generation. Um, and, uh, and, and that is then um, what uh, that Asian population can bring back to the Lutheran church, the understanding of, of how do we do that now? Uh, who are we now? And how we can become uh, more reflective of, of uh, the United States and its demographics. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really, I truly believe that um, within our Lutheran, Asian Lutheran churches, uh, we have some tremendous leaders uh, who are, are truly blessed, both lay leaders and, and professional church worker leaders um, that can influence and, and uh, shape and provide a passion for outreach to our Lutheran church. Yeah, very yeah, good, very good. Very good. Well, very good. Um, so uh, thank you for the questions that uh, we've had from our listeners. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, my thanks and great appreciation also go to Dr. Chan for his uh, sharing his great perspective. And um, may indeed God continue to bless the work that you are doing. Uh, not only in your congregation, but also as your leading uh, mission outreach into the next generation of English speaking Asians. So uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it certainly begins to reflect the complexity of, of, of the Asian Americans among us. And uh, I, I believe them to be a great blessing to our culture. So um, that is all for today. And again, this webinar will be available for uh, future use, both on the uh, Urban and Inner City YouTube channel and also on the Senate website, lcms.org. Uh, search for where we work, national, and then again with Urban and Inner City Mission. So one more thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Chan and also to those who joined us. Uh, may God be with you and bless you. <laughs>